Welcome to the Irresistible Marketing Pod, the podcast that teaches you how to tap into your emotional power to create magical, magnetic marketing. I'm your host, Issa Gauchi, the marketing confidence cheerleader and owner of the M. Issa Messaging Digital Marketing Agency. Today, we're taking things way beyond rainbow capitalism and discussing how businesses can walk the talk of being a true ally. As Valentine's Day draws near and our digital spaces are flooded with imagery and messaging about cis-hetero couples, I wanted to share some thoughts for how businesses can be more inclusive in their marketing. Joining me for this discussion is Renee Johnson, founder, CEO, and clinical supervisor of the Open Space Therapy Collective, a hub for queer and trans therapy based in California. As a licensed therapist, Renee is a wonderful wealth of information about how messaging affects people's mental health. Hello, Renee, and welcome to the Irresistible Marketing Pod. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. So glad to be here. So Renee, as a therapist who specializes in working with um, the LGBTQ plus community, I am so excited to talk with you about what it means to actually be an inclusive business rather than like simply declare yourself as an inclusive Mm -hmm. business and to set the stage for this conversation for why it matters. I was hoping we could start on a personal level, how you see it impact um, clients, their mental health, um, when they are constantly flooded with non-inclusive marketing and non-welcoming businesses, what do you see as the impact from that on a personal level for people? Um, yeah, it's really intense. Our community already feels um, can feel really alienated from life, and like we have to justify our existence and explain and come out like every five minutes and. Um, and marketing and how marketing is done is also a big part of that. Um, I live in LA, and if you look at the thousands of billboards here, that for every movie coming out or fashion thing being put up or whatever, ninety nine point nine percent of it is cis het Eurocentric body beauty standards. And I know I don't identify with any of that, um, even though I have white skin privilege. Um, but that it's really alienating. And a lot of our clients come in and say, like, I think I'm the only person feeling this thing. I think I'm the only person feeling alone and alienated. And I don't match physically or emotionally or identity with everything that's being blasted at me. Um, and it triggers a lot of depression and self-doubt and anxiety and questioning and like the ripple effects out from that is, is drastic. Yeah. And just to like define this a little bit, it's like a combination of not seeing anyone who looks like you or your totally. in marketing, and then also not having messaging that speaks to you and your mm-hmm. feelings and needs. Mm-hmm. And so this leads to just because marketing is everywhere. We're surrounded by <laughs> yeah. Like that's a lot if you're not being shown in anything. Like, of course, that mm-hmm. would lead to feelings of alienation. Um, and on the flip side, when when businesses and and through like their offerings and also their marketing make it clear that they do value um the queer trans community, what do you see that as being the per impact on a personal level for people's mental health? Um, it can be totally the opposite version. And so you're right. And like, it's how things are said. It's how the images are represented. And it's how people then talk about the things that they're seeing and doing. So like marketing is such encompasses kind of everything, um, which we, you know, don't think of it like that, but when it does, in, when it is more inclusive, when it has different, um, body types and it has different genders and it has different partnerships being shown and it has different um, cultural identities being shown, it can often feel like a really big breath of fresh air. Like a lot of um, what we'll see is like the sparkle come back in people's eyes and they'll want to know more and that not just the desire for connection, because I don't think that goes away, but I think um, 
the optimism and encouragement of like, oh, I can connect with other people. There is a place for me. Um, and really bringing in a sense of like strength um, and validation back to oneself is a, is a huge um, positive influence when inclusive marketing is happening. Yeah. And I think it's at this exact moment um, in time is a really interesting time to be having this particular conversation. So for anyone listening in the future, we're recording this on January 30th, 2023. And um, from my perspective, uh, just as, you know, there's been like a a drastic movement between um, when I was a kid and teenager where, you know, maybe it was the L word. (laughs) Like that was, you know, like, maybe it was Will and Grace. Like we were sort of starting to see acknowledgement that gay people existed, um, mm-hmm. but it wasn't much beyond that. And then I feel like we've progressed in, in recent years towards this. Um, it's become mainstream um, and trendy to for businesses to declare themselves an ally and have those signs where like everyone's welcome here. Mm-hmm. And then um, we're at this interesting phase where rainbow capital capitalism has become a thing and we're seeing like rainbow stuff showing up in <laughs> like Walmarts or what have you, PetSmart, yeah. um, which is really interesting because part of me is like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like, this is so cool. It's like we were nowhere um, in the media, in marketing when I was a kid. And the other part of me is like, I'm not sure I trust that these mm-hmm. corporations are in this for the right reasons. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm curious, uh, let me just let you comment on like this moment in time for where we're at in marketing and how you see it affecting people. <laughs> um, rainbow capitalism is so prevalent and it's just so aggravating, right? Like there's this, this thing where companies are like, oh, there's this huge swath of people that we want to want their money and we want them to have our stuff. Um, but we don't actually want to do anything outside of like, put on this cute glittery thing and feel fun. It's like, fuck off. Like that's so horrible. Um, I think Disney is a great example of, of this is Disney will put out like gay content or they'll do things for pride or they'll have like a queer character here and there, which is usually like a queer person that's like an animator doing something sneaky and cool and wonderful and we love that. But then the Disney itself will donate to all of these anti-gay, anti-trans, you know. And so there's this huge disconnect from, hey, we, we're gonna put out there that like we're very allied, but what we're actually doing is keeping the continuation of um, bigotry and hate and all of that stuff going because that's where we're actually putting our money. And so there's a huge, and you can feel it with these companies. Like it feels hollow when you, you know, go target as a big, um, has a big pride section every year um, that is usually very tacky and whatever, but like you, go in and you're like is any did any gay person or any queer person make any of this stuff because I don't think so I think this is probably like what is what sticker thing that's the most legible ever that anybody will wear for a minute that we can sell for five dollars and then everybody will forget about it um I soapboxing a little bit here but it the hollowness I think is definitely palpable yeah, I mean, you're you're here to soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I I want to really highlight that um, you said something like it feels icky, it feels disingenuous, and I want to highlight this so people that listen to this podcast are like business owners and marketing and um, trying to learn how to market in a great way. Mm-hmm. So it is something I want to highlight in this episode that there's a difference between saying something is a value and like walking the chalk and yeah. um, putting your money where your mouth is and kind of making it genuine. So just saying you're an ally to the queer community isn't enough to make it like feel resonant and true. And also just like having an acknowledgement that gay people exist or trans people exist <laughs> is where 
like we're we're a little past the point where that was revolutionary like that's yeah the minimum these days um so Renee um from your perspective what are some ways that um businesses are kind of guilty of declaring allyship and then but having it just be like if they had to show rather than tell it wouldn't sync up mm-hmm. um I think one of the clearest ways for me that I see this often is um, gendering in marketing. Um, As a non-binary person, it's something that stands out to me all the time. But if you're, all of your marketing is gendering everything you're talking about, he, this, she, that, and really heavily um, defaulting to that, but you're not including any of the other gender identities in that, that's a really big cue that like, oh, I'm an ally, but I'm not actually changing how I talk or including anybody or being um, inclusive in my, the way I move around the world. Um, And because we default to that, it's a very obvious thing that it's not something that's being examined and something that comes out in language and in marketing a lot. That's such a good point. I I wanted to talk with you more about the gendering. Um, I think that a lot of businesses, like I'm thinking particularly of like clothing and beauty brands Mm -hmm. where the way it's always been done um, and the way you probably have been taught for a long time to do it is to gender everything. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not the way it's always been done is often not inclusive at all. And I was actually just like, I'm like a secret Fenty Beauty fan. And (laughs) realizing that I love about their marketing is it's um, not just women or femme presenting people. And they've started like including pronouns and like the models or the influences they're including. And so it's people of all genders are using the makeup. And I think that's so cool. And I'm, I'm hoping more brands start doing that kind of thing. And I think what would actually be kind of revolutionary now is instead of like a men's and women's clothing section, like stores just like, what if they came up with totally new delineations or didn't delineate mm-hmm. it at all? And they're like, here's the dress. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then there are models of all genders in it. That would mm-hmm. actually be pretty like revolutionary at this yeah. point. And like, yeah. So like this kind of makes me think of Billy Porter, like, do you remember the tuxedo? I think it was like a Christian Siriano like tuxedo gown Billy Porter wore. Oh, that thing was Porter. amazing. It was amazing and it blew everybody's mind. And now like more um, celebrities of all genders are like rocking looks like that. But like mm-hmm. Billy Porter was like, I don't know if they were the first one, but like definitely one of the first. And so something mm-hmm. I want to shout out marketing wise and business wise is you don't have to wait for it to be normal. It'll actually be more memorable if you're just like, inclusivity is important to me. Non-gendering yeah. is important to me. I'm doing this now. Like, yeah. if you're the first, you're one of the first, like, that's memorable. That's a statement. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but um, yeah, so that leads me into another thing I wanted to ask you about where... I think a lot of businesses, their hearts are in the right place and they're like, I want to be an ally, but they Mm -hmm. might not realize something like having a men's and women's clothing section is inadvertently sending out some red flags. Mm -hmm. I was curious since um, we've uh, talked about this a little bit, whether you have other examples you'd like to share where businesses, where their hearts are in the right place, they genuinely want to be open and welcoming and inclusive. Mm -hmm be accidentally sending out red flags to the queer community that they're not actually going to be safe there. Yeah. Um, I, clothing and beauty is always great. And I love that you're bringing that up because I think there's also a piece of like, oh, it's um, a non-binary person or it's somebody who ident- doesn't identify with gender. And so we need to have the most androgynous things ever in there. And that's just buying into the binary. Um, Alok talks a lot about this and, and they're fantastic, but it's makeup is for everybody. It's, it's, it's face paint. Like you can put it on the wall and the wall doesn't all of a sudden have a gender. It's like, oh, do I feel like pink today? I want to have pink hair. Okay, great. I'm going to do that. It has nothing to do with anything outside that I love pink hair. So it's not 
like, I, I also want to say that in context to like, if you're somebody who's developing a product, you don't have to say, you don't have to gender your product and you don't have to come up with products that are ungendered because they're products, they don't have a gender. And so make what you want to make and have what you want to have. And then let's make it inclusive, um, which you obviously talk a lot about. Um, but some ways that people will market and not know it. Um, I'm thinking, the first thing that comes to mind is um, there's a finance, um, I don't know what he calls himself, um, a finance guru that I really like the way that he talks about things um, and the way that that's really important. Um, he has a podcast called I'll Teach You to Be Rich, Ramit Sethi. I hope he doesn't sue me for whatever I'm about to say. Um, he has never had a queer person on his, sh a queer couple on the show ever. Um, he has, it does a really good job of having people of different classes and backgrounds and races and cultures and all of that stuff. And he tends to be a very left leaning, um, politically, socially left leaning person, but he's never had um, a queer couple of any kind on the show. And it breaks my heart every time. And every time I'm listening to it, I'm like, come on, you can do it, you can do it. And so the part of it is also just representation of like, yeah, he's talking about money and that's not gendered, but also each guest, each het couple that he's having on there doesn't include the rest of us because there's a whole different experience that queer people will have with money that his straight guests will never even think about talking or he'll never think about talking about. Um, and so that's definitely the first like thing that comes to mind out of somebody I have a lot of respect for, and I'm going to hope he, he's not doing that intentionally. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing up like couples, particularly since um, we have the major marketing holiday, which is Valentine's Day coming up. And okay. I'm thinking in, in like um, all sorts of business are, are marketing around Valentine's Day from like lingerie to <laughs> restaurants to cafes. And that's a huge opportunity for um, businesses to be inclusive in their marketing um, by showing different types of couples, maybe even not limited to two people, um, <laughs> intent marketing wise, mm -hmm. um, different mm -hmm. body types, different types of people that I think um, this is one of those things where I, I think a lot of businesses are like, this is what you're supposed to do because this is how it's always been done for marketing to Valentine's Day, where mm -hmm. it goes right over the, their heads that if a queer person is looking at this marketing or a trans person is looking at this marketing, they're like, I'm not going there for my Valentine's Day celebration because we're going to be the only queer people there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, like, and I also just want to highlight that often, so coming from like a corporate background, when I bring stuff like inclusivity up for um, queer people or people of color, they'd be like, well, we'd scare away other customers. <laughs> to that, I want to say, you're kind then you're kind of picking which ones you want to scare away. Mm -hmm. right? It's not like mm -hmm. it's not like there's no queer people in the world with money. Like <laughs> there's a huge customer base available yeah. to businesses that show that they want queer customers. Mm -hmm. But um queer customers or customers with any historically marginalized identity aren't gonna just assume they're welcome. Um I think this is something that business owners that maybe don't have a lived experience of being in a marginalized identity or being close to people in marginalized identities don't understand is that mm -hmm. because in their life, they are able to navigate the world in a way where they assume they are welcome everywhere, um, mm -hmm. unless explicitly told otherwise, they don't realize that it's totally the opposite. <laughs> yeah for folks like queer and trans people or other people mm -hmm. in socially marginalized mm -hmm. identities, like it's literally not safe to assume you're welcome mm -hmm. everywhere. So you need an explicit invitation. Um, and part of the explicit invitation is showing that people like you, they, this business wants you through their marketing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, all right, well, that was my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> yes, preach, preach. <laughs> no, it's totally true. Like every you know, cis het white person in the world feels welcome everywhere, right? Like it is 
rare that that person um, is going to go, oh, wait, do I, am I, is it okay if I go to that bar or that restaurant or go into that shop? Um, because the world is, is made for them, right? And, but it's going to be the bachelorette parties at gay bars as a prime example of that. Like you are in intruding on somebody else's like safe space and you have no qualms about it and you feel like you can be there. Um, and it, it drives me nuts. But on the flip side of that, like you're saying is like, okay, great. I have a restaurant. It's Valentine's day. What am I doing to, to show that everybody is welcome? Because the default is the cishet white people are welcome. And so if I, and I'm, you know, you're the marketing pro here, but like if I'm doing things on social media and then I'm representing other types of relationships and people of color and other types of genders and all of these things, um, it's not going to exclude anybody except some bigots that we don't care about anyway. It's only going to say, oh, the automatic welcome also includes welcoming all of these other people too, um, which then goes, great, I'm going to go spend my money there. I'm going to go support this, or we're going to build a community out that XYZ place. Yeah. And I think like just continuing with this Valentine's Day theme, part of what I want to drive home is that also not just like you're allowed to be here. I'd love to take your money is also <laughs> to like walk the talk of being an ally to the queer trans community, because part of what actually being an ally to the queer trans community means is that you are going to ensure that their presence is safe in your establishment. Um, and yeah. Yeah, you're right. You might get pushed back from people saying they're uncomfortable, et cetera. But part of actually walking the talk of being a safe space, of being a welcoming environment for queer trans community is demonstrating how you are going to handle that shit. Because if that mm -hmm. shit happens in your place of business and you don't protect marginalized people in your establishment, that is mm -hmm. the opposite of walking the talk. And yeah some of how you demonstrate that you are actually you value inclusion is protecting the folks that you are inviting into your space who might receive pushback from other people and you demonstrating how you will protect them from that in your place of business absolutely yeah um it's definitely you can't be if you're comfortable and you're an ally you're not being an ally right like you have to be in the place where, okay, maybe the 10% of these people that were coming here, I'm going to find out that they're um, anti-queer and trans and they're not going to come. So I might have a dip for a minute. But one of the beautiful things about, in, about being an ally is then you, you get to be a part of the community and you get to be a part of the space and you get to help build out community. And I think that's one thing, the way that you approach marketing is... Um, that I really appreciate is this isn't like we live in a uh, society where we all need to get paid because that's how our society works, but nobody's doing it just for the money, right? Like we're doing it to have a community, to have more vibrance in our life, to have people to exchange with and collaborate with and be creative with and, and grow and heal with and all of these things. Um, and so by saying, you know, I'm going to use marketing to say I'm going to build safe spaces and safe communities just enhances the vibrancy that not that you get to participate in. Yeah, 100 percent. And also just to put this in a business perspective, like from a personal queer um, example, there is a, a whisper network for safety <laughs> <laughs> among <laughs> queer trans people about places that are and are not safe for you to go spend your time. So I think a lot of gay people have the experience where they've been a same-sex couple or a, you know, non-straight het presenting couple where they've gone in a business and had a bad experience where the business didn't protect them or they kind of um, both got kicked out or told to calm down or like, you know, had someone say, well, what do you want me to do about it? Um, and I want you to know as a business owner that as queer people, we're going to go tell all our friends in our network not to go support mm -hmm. that business or that mm -hmm. brand. We're not safe there. A hundred percent. 
Yeah. And I'm curious, like, just to bring this back to the personal level as well, um, since I'm sure like in sessions, you work through the emotions and the impact of micro and macro aggressions of when queer and trans people just are out trying to live their lives and mm -hmm. um, they're patronizing a business that's taking their money and then they have a bad experience like this. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how does that affect people when they go spend their money like anyone else, they're just living their life and then they have, they're not protected, they're not valued by mm -hmm. the business's actions. Can you tell us a little bit about what that does to people's mental health. Yeah. Um, I mean, depending, you know, it's trauma by a thousand cons cuts or trauma by like a giant blow. And a, in, in, as queer people, we get both. And um, there's a lot of other marginalized communities that I know um, can align with this also. And it's, living in a world and I think even before the event happens it's already living in a reality where you can be traumatized in a big or small way in any moment um and so you're already being on guard and all are already being like is this okay if then you're at a restaurant and things seem fine and you're going to relax a little bit, you're in a booth, people seem to not be paying attention to you, you're going to relax a little bit. And then the next table that sits next to you, you're out with your partner and don't fit the, the cishet stereotype. And that table is really offended by it and tells you, tells the, um, I'm trying to think of, this happened to a client recently is, um, the cishet couple that sat down told the manager very loudly that they needed to be sat somewhere else because um, this this corner of the restaurant was too dirty for them. And it's soul crushing, right? Like um, my client and their partner were out on a date and it was a Friday, they're relaxing, it's the end of the week. Um, and they went from having special time together to just being completely um, verbally assaulted. And the manager said, oh, um, absolutely, there's another table over here and didn't say anything to the client. And it, it's soul crushing, right? It ruins their night, it ruins the weekend, it makes, busts the door wide open for depression and self-doubt. It has you questioning, um, a lot of times clients will be like, am I making this up? Like." did this happen if everybody else around me is acting like nothing happened and it really like has you second guessing and then has you like it's primed to be more paranoid for it to happen again um and so there's this terrible soup of like hurt depression paranoia anger that just kind of like can turn into a cesspool especially if you're not processing it with a therapist or your community um and it's heartbreaking to to be a part of that's heartbreaking to see. And that's can really be it what's what's at stake when people don't don't actually ally themselves. That's such a heartbreaking example. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it leads to another important topic for walking the talk of your value of being inclusive of the, of the queer trans community which is, I, it's my personal philosophy that if the harm happens in public, the repair also needs to happen in public. Um, people have varying mm -hmm. opinions on that, which is okay. But um, where I think this is important to consider as a business owner is um, if you have like a business with where employees are going to have like front facing public roles, like in a restaurant, et cetera, having a clear policies and trainings for how to handle incidents of bigotry like that, where, um, because I can imagine for that business manager, that was probably stressful for them. And a lot of people, especially if they're not in the queer trans community or of another marginalized identity, this might be the first time they're being put in this mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. So having clear guidance from um, the, the management of the business, like what do we do in these situations where we're um, de-escalating, but also protecting our, our customers mm -hmm. and um, let it and repairing harm 
uh, to these folks. And so we're not just like addressing publicly the loudest person in the room who's causing the yeah. problem, but also bringing repair to the people who are being harmed. Mm -hmm. The other place I see this happen a lot, particularly when brands um, make more moves to be inclusive in their marketing is like comment sections. And mm -hmm. what I often see as what I see as an error in businesses that want to be seen as a queer trans inclusive space is either ignoring or inviting a private conversation or doing some sort of conciliatory response to bigoted mm -hmm. comments. And so what that signals to queer trans people seeing this conversation is that the business is inclusive until they get any pushback and then you're on your own. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so another option for dealing with that is training for the social media manager and permission for the social media mm -hmm. manager who's at, whoever's responsible for those comments to um, respond in a way that shows that this is not um, behavior that's tolerated by the business. Um, mm -hmm. And if you, if it's also part of your values to educate, you can do that, but it is also, mm -hmm. but not at the expense of saying you can go rough shot in my, our brands comment section. I, I just want people to hear that it, it's possible to respond in a way that stands up mm -hmm. for queer trans people that doesn't blow up the situation further. Absolutely. Yeah. And that it happens. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, I think more often than not, if you're not catering to whoever's being hateful in the moment, it gets de-escalated really quickly, right? Like in these scenarios where you, you have a physical location, you can just escort the person out or let them know what the vibe is and they'll go away. I um, read somewhere recently that um, the most uncomfortable person in the room has the tendency to control the room. And part of being an ally is not letting that happen. And so if they're going to be uncomfortable anyway, you can just be like, okay, well, I'm going to reestablish that we're here in this nail salon watching this gay ass show and enjoying ourselves. And if that's uncomfortable for you, then you can uncomfortable yourself out the door and it can just be that. That's so important to state. And I think also like if anyone's been in a situation where they needed other people to stand up and like let the person who's behaving badly know that it's not tolerable, it usually starts with one person, like one person mm -hmm. standing up and then other people join them. Um, mm -hmm. So like we, we need like, that's why I think training and like thinking as a business owner, how you want to handle it as a business when something like this happens so that somebody is prepared for what to do mm -hmm. if something like this happens, because it's really powerful. One person standing up gives a little courage boost to everybody else who feels like they would like to stand up, but maybe don't know what to do in the moment until someone shows mm -hmm. them what to do. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So um, I feel like we have devastated people a little bit. So uh, <laughs> let's move into how can we walk the talk in our marketing? So we've, we've hinted at this a little bit, but in terms of visuals, so like who's being shown in marketing, what would you like businesses to start being aware of in how they visually present brands in their marketing if they'd like to be inclusive of the queer trans community? Yeah, I think especially for small businesses, this can be really hard because um, we tend to need to cut costs as much as possible. And so we go to like free stock images if we're like looking for images. And a lot of those tend to be, um, you know, Eurocentric bodies and, you know, tradition traditional cishet relationship types and all of that stuff. And so you you have to spend extra time and sometimes extra money to make sure that not everybody on your website is this like Euro model person and that you have people that are representative of all relationship types, of all body types, of all skin types, of all ages and abilities. Um, I think it's important to do that. And like, if you need to build a little bit extra into your budget in that area, that's going to make a lot of difference. Yeah. And just to throw a quick, quick plug in there. And just so you know, I'm not affiliated in any way. I make no money from this recommendation, but I have to say canvas kind of stuffed it up in terms of their <laughs> images that are available. 
um, for queer couples. And I'm happy. I, I, I've heard, I've only been on them for about a year or two, but I've heard that like, it wasn't always this way, but they've started like mm-hmm having a lot more types of people be available in their stock stock images, Um, which is also a plug. If you're a company that provides stock images or graphics, Mm -hmm. be inclusive Mm -hmm. in those. Um, So, okay. So we talked a little bit about, um, I think one question people might have, particularly if they're becoming more familiar with non-binary. And so like, Mm -hmm non-binary people can look any type of way right <laughs> like part of mm-hmm. that and there is that like and why a lot of us have started including pronouns in like our little zoom name or our email is because you can't look at a person and be like I know how they identify um yeah so how do you become visually inclusive of non-binary people do you have any recommendations for mm-hmm. businesses there um that's a good question. I think that can really go into are the people that you're posting either um, traditionally look like the gender they were assigned at birth or look like um, a trans person that's a transgender person, right? So are you just doing one binary to the other? Or do you have people that are kind of all through the spectrum in the middle? Um, I myself look very different on the day to day, given the day where some people are like, like, oh, that's definitely like a trans mass person. And other days you wouldn't even bad an eye. Um, But kind of the variety, and this is where fashion can get really fun, right? And color usage and all of this stuff can get really fun. Is are do you have a diversity in? fashion and how people are carrying their bodies and what they are doing, or do you just have these kind of two binary spaces? Yeah. And I'm I'm curious what you think about this. I was kind of thinking a little bit about like, I often compare and contrast like my old corporate marketing life to like how I get into marketing now. And, um, I don't want to stereotype like, cause queer people can look, we, don't have a look right? <laughs> like, <laughs> anybody could be queer but um I am in corporate life like we were really like please no unnatural hair colors be careful with the facial piercings cover up those tattoos um and like sort of out and about like sometimes those things like send off my queer radar a little bit mm-hmm. so I, I'm curious if you have any comment on that like does allowing looks where like I'm assuming that person doesn't work in an investment bank (laughs) what you think about that in terms of visual marketing for inclusivity yeah I mean there's like and it's tricky right this stuff is really tricky because there's like the stereotypical queer look right colored hair um piercings tattoos um you tend to hold your body a little bit to the other side of the gender spectrum than you were assigned at birth. Um, But that's also a stereotype, right? Like the, the, when you were in corporate, I used to work in hospitals and same thing, Um, but that doesn't change my gender identity or who I am. So you also like want to be able to show personality with what you're posting as well as like the different fashion styles like yeah absolutely have tattoos and piercings and colored hair and all of that stuff um but don't treat that like that's what the queer is like the queer is the investment banker the queer is you in corporate the queer is me at the, at the hospital like it's not like variety is is the best thing you can do here Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm reminded of a weird example, but like I, one of my weird hobbies is I love learning, learning about foraging. So wild edible plants. And, um, there are two plants that look kind of similar, but like, you really don't want to mix them up. So there's, um, queen Anne's lace or wild carrot, which is medicinal and edible. And then there's water hemlock, which will kill you. Um, and they look kind of similar, but not real. Like, but like, if you know how to tell the difference, you'll be okay. But our instructor was like, don't you dare just look at the brackets or whether one stem is fuzzy or not, or has purple dots. 
you have to like look at the collection. So it's not like one thing that's going to be mm. like, this one will kill you, this one's edible. You have to like kind of look at the full picture. So I think that's a good thing to bring up that like visually we can be inclusive, but it's not enough to be like, here is a person that m- might send off some people's gaydar because that's, that's <laughs> not enough to be like, I want queer people to come in here because you're right. Queer people are everywhere and come in all different looks and aesthetics. So um, visual visually is one way to start signaling that you are actually value inclusivity, but it's not like the only thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like same with language too. Like if you're telling, you know, a lot of marketing happens through storytelling. And so having some of those stories be queer stories or include queer elements to those stories or um, it's really like a, a way to add variety um, and don't be like a will and grace stereotype as you do it. Um, but like you're saying, that collection of things, um, you know, like queer pe- people are also not like anti-straight people. Like that's fine. You don't, you can have straight stories and you can have queer stories and you can have everything in between and, and please do. Yeah, 100%. So continuing on like how we we walk the talk of inclusivity in terms of um, like language we use, we talked a little bit about phasing out binary language and delineations and stuff like clothing stores or makeup. Um, and then I mentioned the two examples of that I've been seeing happen more and more these days that are exciting. Like a I've in like business zooms, I've had more and more people leading the meeting, ask people to put their pronouns in their, um, name that shows up in your little face square, which I think is cool. Mm -hmm. Um, I was at Trader Joe's and I was noticing people had their pronoun, um, on the like little cashier Mm -hmm. button thing, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I've also noticed that in a lot of email signatures, uh, pronouns have become much more common, which is very cool. Instagram Mm -hmm. lets you have them now. Um, so it's becoming more mainstream. I'm curious when we think about language in particular, that's used in marketing. Um, do you have thoughts on, um, how we can use the language to be inclusive and welcoming? Yeah, um, that is a huge, that is a big question. Um, you know, I love what you were saying earlier about having training around this, um, cause it's gonna be different for what you're marketing. Um, and so like, yes, gender and more gender diversity in your language is um, really important, more, um, diversity in the, the stories that you're telling is really important. Um, but also if even as like, um, a queer person myself, I will still run whatever we're doing by a bunch of other people with different intersectional identities than I have to make sure that I'm not like default doing something by accident. And so like, like in thinking about like collaboration and community, like this is a place where that can really do well. Um, One, hire a wonderful marketing person like yourself who will help you do this. Um, But also have people that um, in your community and, you know, if it's other entrepreneurs or other writers in your life or whatever that is to run that by you that that aren't from the same background or don't have the same identity as you. I think it's really important. That is such a great point because I think like sometimes people get overwhelmed. Like a lot of people have felt like called to learn a lot of, about a lot of things all at once that they, that, it, that are new to them. And then they feel afraid to speak. And that's such an important point that you don't have to know how to do everything yourself. You can hire DEI firms, you can hire inclusive marketers you can have different people in your community. Like I would recommend, like if you're asking people to do work for you, like review your marketing and branding to make sure it's not accidentally sending out red flags, like please pay them. That's work. Um, yes, yes, <laughs> but yes, yes. Um, that's a, 
such a great point that there, there are people whose literal jobs it is to help you with this, to make sure your language is inclusive. Um, and then also like by different setting, it's probably going to be different. Like there are probably settings where um, it's appropriate and you have the space and time and microphone to like maybe start your dance class with like a little discussion of our rules of engagement and how we relate to other people or talk to people. Um, there are other times where you might be like a person at a business conference where your speaking time is a little more limited and who you can interact with. Um, but I, I think the other thing I'd like to highlight here is that thinking through as a business, how you want to handle these situations and how you want to address this and, you know, give yourself some accountability or regular check-in that you are presenting your brand in a way that is walking the values that you hold is super, mm -hmm. super good advice. Um, mm -hmm. And then I wanted to lastly ask you about if you had thoughts on hiring. So I think we all have seen examples in like TV shows or um, media where the writer's room is diverse, suddenly the storylines start speaking to a lot more of us than we're used to having mm -hmm. signal pops devoted to us. Um, so inclusive hiring is huge because then you do have those actual voices contributing to making your business and marketing and shaping it and reviewing it in a way that welcomes the queer trans community. But I think there is often a barrier people don't think about to, to like getting those people in the door in the first place to like mm -hmm. in the interview for hiring. Do you have any thoughts on um, how businesses can make their hiring practices inclusive of queer trans people? Um, yes, it, it, that's something that um, that we've been really trying to work on a lot. Um, and some things that we've found successful is really like including those conversations um, at the very beginning in the job posting. Why it's important in your marketing, it's also going to reflect who's going to apply to what you've got going on. If um, you want more diverse backgrounds, but you only got one type of person on your website, nobody's going to, uh, no, no people of other backgrounds are going to apply there because it's going to signal not safe. Um, but having those conversations in your very first interview and starting it there and seeing how people align with that or don't, having your high, whoever's doing your hiring um, trained in this and what that means as well. Um, I think, you know, as, as a white person, I try and do as much um, anti-racist work on my own as possible. I think that's really important. Um, and keeping yourself accountable to those things because it's going to continue to have a, a positive ripple effect as you work through your business. And so, especially for small businesses, everything we do for ourselves personally is going to transform how we engage and how we run our businesses. So there's also a, a place in there where um, you need to be doing your own um, anti-racist, anti-queer, anti-trans work and supporting your team doing that also and supporting an environment where that can conversation can continue to happen. Um, even if it's somebody who works for you and is 20 years younger than you can say, and feels comfortable saying like, hey, you said this thing in a meeting and that's actually not cool. Excellent points. Well, Renee, I don't want to keep you too late, but thank you so much for having this really important and helpful um, conversation with our audience. How can people keep up with your work and work with you? Moving forward. Yeah. Um, so our website, openspacetherapycollective.com, um, you can learn about us and what we do. Um, we have Instagram, TikTok, um, Facebook at Open Space Therapy Collective. Um, and we are about to start a podcast that should come out at the middle end of February called My Therapist is Out. And yeah, um, so we will have um, different therapists on every episode, different people in our community talking about everything, mental health, queer, trans, POC. Um, so we've already got a bunch of topics and our um, crew started to record and it's, the conversations that are coming are really fun. Um, and of course, if you are in California and uh, need mental health care, we are here for you.
All right, awesome. And we'll have those links for you um, for handy reference in the show notes. So you can just go right to the place where you most want to follow Renee and Open Space Therapy Collective. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Isa. Feeling inspired to create irresistible, inclusive marketing? Me too. Want an amazing community to create that marketing with? Me too. Which is why I am opening Club Content Cauldron this March 2023. The club is a fabulous four-week creative container that will give you the encouragement, the accountability, the glam, and the fun to show up for your marketing and get results like never before. Early bird pricing lasts through midnight Pacific time this Sunday, February 12th. Plus, the first three people to check out win a free one-on-one cheerleading session with me. So hop on that link and go sign up for the club because it's going to be so much fun. Anywho, thank you so much for joining us today. It means a lot to me to have you here. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to keep them coming, please consider leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts to help others find this fabulous free resource. Keep up with all things irresistible marketing by following at MISA messaging or at M-I-S-A messaging on Instagram and Facebook and signing up for our newsletter at M-I-S-A messaging.com. And you can find all the links to follow Renee and Open Space Therapy Collective in their upcoming podcast, My Therapist is Out, in the show notes.